Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamek. Berto is your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. As usual, we are going to be back talking about the coronavirus, but in a different context, right? Yes, it's a, it, it's taking away the health of many people. It's Yes, it is, to put it bluntly, killing a whole lot of mostly older folks that seem to be uh, more reactive to the virus than younger folks who seem to get over it fairly quickly from what we've understand, uh, understood so far. But there are other issues that, uh, that makes it clear that uh, we are not prepared for a pandemic and that one of the things that we're not prepared for, well, both on a health-wise and for other things that it creates. We're going to talk, we're going to have an interview with a candidate in Georgia. This would be her second interview with us, but uh, she had a, a particular reason for uh, that I wanted to get her on after she contacted the FEC to mitigate some of the issues that are of concern to her. Uh, but before we get to the program, I want to start out with a few uh, few things, right? It turns out that um, MSNBC, one of the hosts today, she did something that I found not only interesting, necessary, but I that I wish more people did. People have a tendency to respect hosts that are on the news. And when they start to make comments after an interview, after a matter-of-fact interview, when they start to make comments, people sort of, and I hate to put it this way, but people sort of get permission to listen or permission to think. I mean, it's sad that it works that way many times, but that's how it works. So what I want to play for you is this MSNBC host particular statement at the end of an interview that shows how backward our system is. Gregory Bartz, welcome aboard. Our system is, and how frustrated she seemed to be as one that is seeing it in her interviews on the front line. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and uh, play this for you, and then we'll take it on the other side. Check this out. Who's the person in charge that would be able to, Dr. Morse, to take away that red tape? Is it the CDC director? Uh, is it Vice President Pence, who's now the, the head of the coronavirus task force? Is it the president? I think basically it needs to be the president. And, and what I would say is there's sort of two issues that come into play here. One is the red tape, which is substantial. Again, there's nothing magic about the test. Many of us have tests that work beautifully. Yep. It's the red tape, but the other side is the cost. Unfortunately, our medical system is driven by, by cost and cost accounting. What has already been mentioned, the administrators say, hey, who's going to pay for that? Yeah. Um, we're actually providing free tests uh, here at University of Florida because it is so complicated to figure out who's going to pay. And, but that's not sustainable. Um, there has to be a system to pay. And the reality is that um, the commercial companies have got beautiful giant machines that can run thousands of tests a day. Um, but they are going very slowly because it is unclear who's going to pay for it, what the payment mechanisms are. And so the bureaucracy initially discouraged tests from being put online. Um, but now the, the problems are who's going to pay for it. And um, until there is a clear yeah. pathway, Administrators say, well, show me something in writing that says I'm going to get paid if you do this test for this patient. Regardless of um, how you feel about it, that is a symptom of a privatized health care system. That right there, frustrating. I found that prescient. That is a result of a privatized health care system. And then she puts her personal feeling in there, frustrating frustrating it is you know and this has these things have material effects on our economy it has material effects on much uh let's see uh welcome aboard michael rodnin michael's uh welcome aboard dalia lugo uh let's see welcome aboard bruce welcome aboard bruce yes i went ahead and i saw the president's um uh i i took i, I took i i listened to the president but there's nothing that the president ever says anymore that I actually take seriously, nor should anyone 
really take what the president says seriously anymore. I think they need to go to other sources if they really want to understand what is going to happen in this country. But like I was mentioning before, as it turns out, these things have a material effect on our politics. It also has a material effects, uh, effect on our economy. So last night, uh, one of President Obama's old, uh, I guess he was the director of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, his name was Robert, I don't remember, it'll, it'll come on in a minute. He had something to say about it. I, I, I did a, a, a piece last night with it, so I want to play the piece that I did last night because it is important that we understand what is really going on, how the coronavirus was not necessarily the cause of this current crash and recession that we're going to have, but nothing more than the trigger. But because we're talking about the coronavirus, I'm going to leave it with in, in that domain. Check this out. When Reagan came into power, he brought us voodoo economics, Reaganomics, supply-side economics. And what it did is he used deficit spending and huge, uh, huge cuts, all these kinds of things to really explode the deficit and with that, inflate the economy. It took Bush 1 and Bill Clinton to raise taxes and do the necessary things to readjust the economy and bring it back to some form of sanity. When Bush 2 came along, he came to a surplus in the budget. He came with a, with, with a, great, a great economy, and he did the same thing. He blew it apart, and they're ending with the great 2008 recession. Some people call it a depression. Uh, then came, after being handed a very good economy, a great economy, that, well, not a great economy, but a very good economy, uh, we got... Senor Trump, he comes in and he simply gets extremely irresponsible with it, with tax cuts that exploded the budget, deregulation that hurt a whole bunch, and we're paying the price for it, right? He closed down the uh, office that took care of pandemics and much more. And we are now seeing the results. A market in free fall. Uh, one of Obama's old advisors, uh, Council of Economic Advisors, Jason Furman, has a thought on that. So let's go ahead and play that and we'll take it on the other side. Is this 1987 or is this 1929, which you've already answered that it's closer to that. I've, uh, <laughs> but maybe about six months ago, I reread uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's book, The Great Crash, about the 1929 stock market crash. And when you read the things people were saying, uh, as it was already underway, as the crash was happening, uh, there's so many people who sounded like Donald Trump saying it will bounce back, as the president said today, the, the stock market will bounce back. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, Larry Kudlow, the other day saying invest uh, as it's going down. You know, you'll be very happy with that. And of course, it's dropped dramatically since Kudlow said that. So just to set this uh, for our audience perspective, you are comparing now to the 1929 crash of the stock. Um, absolutely. And, you know, the difference is it depends on what happens. If, you know, we get through this virus in the next two months, then, you know, maybe it bounces right back. If it takes us nine months, even at that point, if we find a cure for the vaccine, a lot of damage, a huge amount of damage will be done to companies, to workers, to unemployment of a type that would persist and, you know, take, could take a long time to, to recover from. So I, you know, I, I'd love to be, have more reassuring things to say for you, Lawrence, but I, I just, I am. I am worried right now. Well, you're confirming what I've been feeling in my, my amateur way about this. But so this presents an enormous policy making challenge, because when you talk about things like payroll tax cut, which the president mentioned uh, a few days ago, and it died instantly uh, when the Senate Finance Committee chairman said he wouldn't even consider it, th that could come back. But a payroll tax cut to a person who's no longer on a payroll uh, doesn't work the way it might have, but in the stimulative way you might have wanted it to while that person was still on a payroll. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So what I think we should do is number one, everything we can do on health, free testing, which is in the House legislation. I think that's terrific. We're going to need a lot of hospital beds, a lot of ventilators. We're going to need that fast. Number two, anything we can do targeted at the people that most need it. That includes paid leave, unemployment insurance, 
insurance, assistance for states with their Medicaid programs, and nutritional assistance. Once you've done one and two, that's still not large enough. There's still tens of millions of families you haven't reached. So number three, I would send checks, I'd send cash, you get it whether you're working, whether you're not. A week ago, I proposed $1,000 for an adult, $500 for a child. I would at least double it based on the events of the last week. And this is one of those moments where, from a poly policy perspective, quite literally the last thing you can worry about is the deficit and the debt. Uh, but unfortunately, we are at a high point in both deficit and debt. It's the last thing you want to worry about. First of all, the real interest rate, that's the interest rate right now is negative. That means you can give somebody $1,000 today, the government can borrow that money, and a decade from now, you only need to repay $900 adjusted for inflation. So, you know, that's one thing. The second thing is, let's say you really were concerned about the debt. You care about the debt relative to the economy. If the economy craters, the debt is actually larger relative to the economy. Right now, we can't afford, from a fiscal perspective or an economic perspective, not to do something something no, as big as we possibly can. Let me tell you what sort of upsets me. Uh, it, has, it, it upsets me because what Furman just talked about is, uh, could be aspects of what we, what's known as modern monetary theory. And right now you have most of the classic economics uh, professors and economists right now laughing at that. Oh, that will create all these deficits, etc., etc. But we know that's not true. Where there's no scarcity, that's not true. But here is the thing. Because corporations are in trouble now, I mean, all these businesses have to close. People are at the grocery stores buying all kinds of foods and supplies to stay home. So therefore, there's no expectation that the stocks for all these companies that will be affected, it's going to rise. So therefore, we in the condition that we're in, the advice that uh, Jason Furman is given is sound advice. The only thing is, it's modern monetary theory to go ahead and implement these, these things that he's talking about. Some of what Andrew Yang talked about, some of what uh, Bernie Sanders talked about, all these things combined is what can uplift again and revitalize the economy. Sad thing is, Right now, we have a permanent underclass, and we can use these same techniques to inflate some more so that we can bring everybody into the economy. Why is it that we have to wait for struggling corporations before everybody sees that, yes, it is okay to give stipends, yes, it is okay for deficit spending as long as there is no scarcity? Folks, we have to learn a tad bit about economics so that we can force these politicians not to make the corporatocracy tell them what to do, but for us to have politicians who do what's best for the common person. Now, you see, it is important that we tie that statement because it, it, did, it did involve the coronavirus, but we have to tie those things together because they are all interconnected. The coronavirus... It creates, it creates disruption. You can fix, you can help disruptions by having a, a solid safety net. You can also help make sure that the, that the coronavirus isn't spread as much if you don't have to worry about, can I really afford to go and get tested? Well, if, if, you, don't, if you don't have a good insurance system, a single pair Medicare for all system, if you're dependent on the private system, you're going to be concerned whether to go test or not. And if you don't go test, you'll be infecting that many more people. If, you, uh, if the government has to crack down and say, oh, we're going to have to ask people to, to go ahead and quarantine themselves. The next question they have to ask themselves, if I'm quarantined, I, can't, I have to go to work. I can't afford to survive if I don't go to work. So again, social safety net. Uh, where is, the, where is the, the, the employment leave that allows people to do that? And likewise, if you have children, where is the family care for that, where is the care for kids? I mean, we have such a lousy, a lousy uh, safety net in our social services that everybody want to call socialism. If that's the case, give it to me. We have a lousy safety net. And because of that, it makes these pandemics that much worse because people go ahead and infect other people because they have to go to work. People go ahead and infect others because they have kids that they, ha they I mean, it is, it, is a, 
it, it is a cycle of death. It is a cycle of death that we have to understand. Now, one of the commenters, I think it was Lee Grant, is stating that, oh, per the president is doing good. He's, he's using the fusion of the private sector and the public sector. You know, you see that as a positive, right? I see that as li a likely negative. I see that as the president holding back the public sector from effectively working to give the private sector a chance to prop up and get involved and get their piece of the action. I don't see that as a benevolent thing. I see him throwing, uh, getting rid of the, the, the pandemic office and all these things so that the private sector can pick it up if it's needed. But the private sector is not going to pick it up unless it is needed and they see a place where they can make a profit. The cart or the horse. The cart or the horse. The, using the private sector in healthcare, I repeat, using the private sector in paying for healthcare or in leading healthcare is not only a clear and present danger, it is immoral, it is evil, and to put it as nice as I can, it is rather stupid. And you know I don't use those words quite often on my show because I think in we should always try to be positive. So I'm going to play the first thing that I played again because there are a lot of new people that came in. But I think it is essential to understand. Uh, when you see a host on a corporate media shakes her head in disgust after listening, it tells you something. So I want to play this again before I get into the, the other interview that we have. Who's the person in charge that would be able to, Dr. Morse, to take away that red tape? Is it the CDC director? Uh, is it Vice President Pence, who's now the, the head of the coronavirus task force? Is it the president? I think, basically, it needs to be the president. And, and what I would say is there's sort of two issues that come into play here. One is the red tape, which is substantial. Again, there's nothing magic about the test. Many of us have tests that work beautifully. Yep. It's the red tape, but the other side is the cost. Unfortunately, our medical system is driven by, by cost and cost accounting. What has already been mentioned, the administrators say, hey, who's going to pay for that? Yeah. Um, we're actually providing free tests uh, here at University of Florida because it is so complicated to figure out who's going to pay. And, but that's not sustainable. Um, there has to be a system to pay. And the reality is that um, the commercial companies have got beautiful giant machines that can run thousands of tests a day. Um, but they are going very slowly because it is unclear who's going to pay for it, what the payment mechanisms are. And so the bureaucracy initially discouraged tests from being put online. Um, but now the, the problems are who's going to pay for it. And um, until there is a clear yeah. pathway, uh, our administrators say, well, show me something in writing that says I'm going to get paid if you do this test for this patient. Regardless of um, how you feel about it, that is a symptom of a privatized health care system. That right there, frustrating. And that's the point. The evil within it. Oh, we are going to hold back services. We'll let people die until we find out if, is somebody going to pay for this stuff? Is somebody going to pay for this stuff? Folks, um, when you can't understand the immorality here, when you don't understand this immorality, this evil, this uh, what I call uh, knowing, uh, what, what is it called? Uh, it, it is, it's not homicide, but, but uh, yeah, it is. You know, I mean, it's, it's not really, it's not homicide. It is, it is voluntary manslaughter. I think we should now call it voluntary person slaughter. And the reason why is, these guys know that their test is going to save people, but they won't do the test. Why? Because are we going to get paid? And that's why it doesn't belong in a place where somebody would ask the question, are we going to get paid? Anyhow, let's go ahead and talk about the program and the person I wanted to feature on the program today. Coronavirus forces on insured progressive candidate Nabila Islam from door to door canvassing. Nabila Islam, Democratic candidate for Georgia Congressional District 7, is affected directly by both coronavirus and the lack of medical care that she has. She must suspend her grassroots door-to-door -door canvassing. The coronavirus is just another headwind that puts poor and middle-class America as potential candidates for political offices and much more at a major disadvantage. 
Nabila Islam works on a small budget, mostly from small contributors. She has been dependent on grassroots actions, door-to-door -door canvassing, and other flesh-to-flesh -flesh communication with her constituents. Reaching many will be more difficult. Wealthy candidates can always saturate their messages by mail, email, TV advertising, and online advertising. A candidate that cannot afford health insurance would be hard-pressed without an influx on contributions to maintain a very competitive position. So I tell you, if you want to help this woman, you can always go to nabilaforcongress.com because I tell you what, grassroots need support to ensure that we are not just run by a whole bunch of corporate hacks. We do need all of us to support our progressive media, our independent media, our progressive young candidates that are out there who want to make a difference. Young people start seeing people like that. They start to, uh, they start to fall apart. They, they start to be a part of the system. But anyhow, without any further ado, let's go ahead and uh, get this busy with Nabila Islam. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. I am honored today once again to be with Nabila Islam. Nabila Islam is running for Congress uh, for Georgia 7, Dis Georgia District 7 for the United States Congress. She is a progressive. She is a millennial. She is a, uh, a woman of color. She's everything we've been asking for to make this Democratic Party look exactly like what America looks like. Welcome aboard once again, Nabila Islam. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. I thank you so much for having me back on today. Well, um, let me tell you. Uh, I'll be honest. I was reading Common Dreams, one of the uh, progressive rags that I love to to read. They have great articles, and I saw your article about you're a grassroots movement person. You campaign within the grassroots. Now we have this uh, this scare, not a scare, but a reality of the COVID nineteen, the coronavirus. And you are having to modify your campaign accordingly. Because of the way you run, it puts you at a disadvantage. Why don't you tell me about that? And then we'll go into other features of your campaign and other things that you're doing. So, um, as you said, this is a grassroots campaign. It's a people-powered campaign. And the way that we've been getting the word out and the message about our progressive campaign is by knocking on doors. And that's been a big part of our campaign. And so... With the spread, the quick spreading of the coronavirus, I was made the diff difficult decision to suspend all in-person canvassing, uh, uh, which includes door-to-door -door knocking, because I want my staff, my volunteers uh, to stay safe in this time. And I myself don't feel comfortable knocking on doors uh, because I don't actually can't afford, I don't have health insurance right now. Um, and so we are having to switch strategies to figure out how we're going to still contact all these voters and so we're uh, working on that right now now um, I want to kind of centralize on something that you just said that I hope every American understand you are running for one of the highest offices in this land you are running to be a congressperson representing a district uh, you are out there going to make laws and you are unable mm -hmm. to run the type of campaign that you want to run a people-based grassroots campaign because you don't have health insurance. This shows, I think, more so than anything else, that this has a material effect not only on the individual, but on the body politic of the United States and who can be represented in the body politic of the United States. So why don't you expand on that and tell me how that affects your particular group, how that affects people from across the entire country. Well, I'm a working American and I am running full time uh, for Congress right now. And I cannot afford to also pay for private health insurance. And so right now I don't have uh, access to health care. And uh, I didn't realize how big of a barrier this was until I started to campaign. Um, I actually asked for the first time in history uh, for the FEC to allow working class candidates like me to be able to use campaign funds to pay for health care. Um, you know, I've been running for over a year now, 
And the way the laws are, are, are set up is that you can only use campaign funds until you qualify. Well, my qualifying period was about last week. And so, you know, you have candidates for running for long periods of time, not being able to uh, pay for health care. And right now what we're seeing is uh, these are structural barriers and that's and it's preventing people like me from, you know, occupying you know, halls of power in Congress. Um, right now, about 40 percent of Congress is millionaires. The average net worth of a congressperson is 500,000. Uh, we have less than 25 percent of Congress is women. Less than 10 percent are women of color. So this is uh, a huge uh, barrier for people like me uh, to run for office. Uh, you know, I actually saw the other day that Congress, Congressman Ocasio-Cortez didn't even have health insurance when she was running for Congress. Uh, Tiffany Caban, uh, when I actually started to tweet about this issue, uh, mentioned that she almost didn't run because between her student loans and um, health insurance. And so th this is something that is critical in removing this barrier in allowing more people that have been sitting on the sidelines for, uh, so that they will get involved and run for office too and represent their communities. Interestingly, I interviewed uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez just before she got, uh, just before she beat the Democrat that she that that sprung her into office, and that was one of the issues that we discussed offline: not having health insurance. And again, many Americans uh, have been taught to believe that asking for Medicare for all is a fringe issue, a left-wing issue. I think one of or uh, people like you and your stories have to be out there to let Americans know it, it affects every facet of your life. I mean, mm -hmm. that a young woman like yourself has to think, who, who has value to offer to the body politic, has to ask, can I do this because I have health insurance or not? That, is, that makes our political system a farce. It makes our political system a farce because it says, only a few who has these possibilities or these uh, these attributes can apply to be um, to, to run. So let me let me go to the other question because um, I'm I'm happy first of all that you are that you are asking the FEC to modify the rules to allow those of you who are running. I mean, I imagine you can pay for your campaign staff to uh, health insurance with your campaign funds, right? But it's just yes. not yours. Exactly. So I make sure that my staffers have a stipend to pay for health care. Um, however, it is against FEC rules. It would violate FEC rules if I took a stipend uh, to pay for health care. Makes absolutely no sense, given that it is a job as you are running for uh, for that particular position. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. And, I, you know, you wonder many times, Nabila, whether these things are done by design. Because this, this question that we're talking about is actually a sort of marginally away from Medicare for All, right? This is a particular instant where th the funds could be there for you to be covered medically while you run, but mm -hmm. laws prevent you from doing so, which puts you at a disadvantage from a candidate who has health insurance or who has means. So I, I think there, there are two discussions here, how the campaign laws are written and in fact, Medicare for all two, two distinct, but intersecting issues. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm having to do this because we don't have Medicare for all. Um, it's unacceptable that anyone goes without access to health care because they can't afford it. Um, that's why, you know, I, I'm hoping the FEC will rule in my favor and so that more working Americans like me run for office, more progressives can run for office and advocate for progressive policies like Medicare for all and uh, work to pass them once they get to, to Congress. Now, great. Let's talk a little bit about your campaign now. I mean, uh, that issue, we wanted to get it out of the way because, again, it is an important issue. Medicare for all is an important issue. How is your campaign going? How are you, uh, how are you finding the people within your district reacting to the, the progressive policies that you stand for? Then more so than not, are the policies your district needs right now? Well, people have uh, been responding really positively. I think the last time I was on your show, I talked about how typically people run Republican Republican light campaigns. Yes, and they're afraid to take uh, real policy stances. I'm the only candidate in my primary that has policies on their website. I'm being very outspoken of where I stand on these issues.
I'm advocating for Medicare for all, a living wage at $15 an hour and a Green New Deal. And this working class district, uh, you know, need these policies to implement the transformational change that we need to uplift this community. So the people in my district, uh, they're, they're telling me that these policies are great. These, they've been waiting for these policies, that, th that these policies resonate with them. And so we've seen so much momentum um, around our campaign. And so far, we've had um, some really great positive endorsements from Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, uh, Congress, uh, Congressman uh, Ro Khanna, Dr. Abdullah Syed just endorsed me the other, other day. And so people are, are, are coalescing around our campaign and getting the word out. Uh, folks are excited. Uh, when I was canvassing, we were canvassing about every other day. Uh, people are phone banking, text banking. And so I think that this is a moment in our community where we feel like we have someone that is really speaking up for the issues that are affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, uh, given that you're not going to be canvassing and having that, that touchy-feely moment that is very effective with your, um, with your constituents, um, are, you, are you raising enough money that you can kind of get on to, let's say, at least cable, cable uh, some cable ads, etc.? Well, that would be nice. I, we, are, um, we have been raising consistent money. Uh, we've raised over um, $500,000 so far. 90% mm -hmm. of that is um, from small dollar donors, from people across the district, across my state, and across the country because they really believe in the message that um, I am carrying. And um, what's happening is because we've suspended canvassing, which was such a crucial part of our um, our campaign, it was actually a big part of our budget. We've been having to shift our strategy to double down on um, virtual ta um, outreach, such things such as phone banking. Um, we're also um, scheduling my first virtual town hall uh, coming up soon, and so and I think this will be an opportunity for voters to still get to know about our campaign. Uh, with that being said, um, this pandemic um, has, you know, obviously all campaigns are having to shift right now. Um, I've had a couple of, uh, you know, fundraisers and meet and greets that have been canceled that I was actually relying on of, of raising money off of. Um, and that's not happening. And so we have to, sh and I'm only about 70 days out from our election. So we're having to figure out how do we make up for the, the those holes in our budget right now. And so um, I, I hope to have money to do all of those things that you said, um, but I, and I feel like we will, we just got to work on it. Well, you know, I, I, I was, if you notice, I gave you the silent wave there for the virtual town halls, because I think a lot of young people like yourself can use not only the Zooms and the Periscopes and all these other forms. I, I was watching an Ilan Omar um, live, live update today on her, on her channel, and, it, and what I felt in watching that she turned it on and immediately got 1,600 people to watch. It's like, you know what? We, if we use our tools and we, we tell the story, I think we can be effective. One of the issues is that a lot of us are not yet using the tools. I know you will be using the tools quite effectively as soon as I heard you talk about virtual town halls. So you are the kind of candidates we've been longing for in the progressive movement for a very, very long time. So I mean, what I'd like to... Um, ask you to do right now is give us a statement uh, give us we, we know there, there's we are still hoping that uh, we get a progressive candidate at the head of the ticket there's a likelihood that we may not and in mm -hmm. in that case uh your your value would have gone up exponentially in having to push a more moderate top of the ticket into the positions that we know are best for the for the uh for the body politic, not just progressives, but for us all. So uh, that, that said, uh, how do you intend on working with those who may not see the light in being as progressive as this country needs you and everybody else to be? Well, when I am talking to people all across the district, you know, I tell them that I'm a working class candidate running on a working class platform. And these policies that I'm advocating for are going to uplift our communities. And when I explain that to them, uh, it makes sense. And, and people are inspired by that. Um, I feel like if in order to flip districts like mine, I tell people all the time that we don't need moderate candidates. We're going to need a progressive candidate that inspires people, that expands the electorate. 
in order to flip this district. And I, I, I hope we have a more progressive person at the top of the ticket because I believe that's how we're going to motivate people to come out and vote in large numbers. And now if that doesn't happen, we're going to need candidates like me to push up numbers all across the country uh, to, to inspire young people to come out and vote and working class people to come out and vote because they'll know that they'll have champions fighting for them in Congress. Irrespective of the top of the ticket, we do need candidates like you. So um, first of all, thank you for running. Now, in closing, what I'd like to ask you to do is uh, enumerate uh, your policies that will help not only Georgia 7, but all working class Americans, all poor Americans, all middle class Americans in a manner that they can see. You are not some fringe candidate, but the policies you stand for are the policies, not only policies they need, but policies that they want. Oh, absolutely. So um, I'm advocating Medicare for all. I believe that healthcare is a human right. I'm advocating for living wages, for economic justice, that if you uh, work hard, you should be paid a fair living wage. I'm advocating for Im comprehensive immigration reform and getting ICE out of our communities. In fact, abolishing ICE. I'm advocating for criminal justice reform. Uh, we need to bring justice back into our, our criminal justice system and abolishing private and detention centers and uh, decriminalizing cannabis at the federal level and making sure that we're addressing this climate crisis with bold, aggressive policies like a Green New Deal. And these are the policies that I will champion when, once I get to Congress because um, these are the policies that are actually going to change our lives for the better. Nabila, let me tell you, I want to make sure that people go to your site, learn about you, but not only learn about you, but realize that the only way we are going to get uh, our progressives in office is all people feel they have a stake in the game. Folks, where can they go to learn about you? Where can they go to support you, both through donations and otherwise? Well, you can go to my website, which is www.nabilaforcongress.com. It's N-A-B-I-L-A-H-F-O-R, congress.com. You can sign up to volunteer. Uh, we have remote volunteer opportunities. You can pitch in and contribute $5, 10 $20, or whatever, whatever you can. Um, and I have all my policies on my website. Like I mentioned before, I'm the only candidate with policies in this primary. Um, and I think you'll like what you see. And if you Google Nabila Islam, there's a... A couple dozen articles about the campaign as well. Nabila Islam, a candidate, Democratic candidate for Georgia District 7. Thank you so kindly for having been here on Politics Done Right. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. That is a very, very smart woman if you... Yeah, speaking to her both offline or online, it is, it is quite evident that is the future. She represents the future. A lot of young people represent the future of uh, this country. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is we need them activated as soon as possible because too many of us, too many of us have allowed a corporatocracy, too many of us have allowed the wealthy a plutocracy to be selfish and do as they please and in doing so, they have affected the personal economies of most Americans. Even some of those Americans that support them, they have hurt their, their they have used ideological games. They have used all kinds of games on these people to convince folks to vote against their own interests. Folks, please do remember this is a progressive show that needs your support. Please consider going ahead and getting some of our stuff if you know what I'm talking about. We have a t-shirt out there called I Support Independent Media. Please go to store.politicsdoneright.com. Support us. Support us by getting some of our little teats and tats t-shirts. Uh, uh, we have things like as I see my book, As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. I even have another book. It's not This one isn't a political book, but it is How I Lost Weight and Got Healthy because I was unhealthy for a while. And likewise, you can get, you know, t all kinds of T-shirts there. Funny ones like uh, the ones to lock up El Senor Trump or the one that says, um, Bernie says, hey, things never happen until they happen, man. Kind of something like that. So please check that out. But alternatively, alternatively, you can support our, you can support our show 
by becoming subscribers. And we really would love to have your subscription. We need several thousand subscribers. You can do so by going to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash politics done right. Again, that is Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash politics done right. If you are on YouTube, you can click on that dollar sign and give us a super chat. We love those super chats that, you know, you just uh, put a few bits of support there for us. Alternatively, you can support our equipment fund. Our equipment fund it is at gofundme.com slash independent dash media dash upgrade. Again, it is at in the, it, it is at gofundme.com slash independent dash media dash upgrade. And of course, you can go ahead and contribute directly, whether on a single one time or several or, or in you know however you want at uh, paypal.me slash politics done right. Again, that is paypal dash me. Oops, I, I put that in wrong. Let me go ahead and fix that. Uh, it's that's that's wrong. Here it is. It is paypal.me slash politics done right. But then again, don't forget to go to our store. Don't forget to go to our store or super chat me. Okay, enough of that. Enough of that, but we do need your support, so please be so kind to support the program. All right, folks, um, what else we want to talk about today? Um, first of all, the telephone lines are wide open. Let me put that on the screen. The telephone numbers are wide open. You can reach us at uh, 7, uh, whoops, what is it? 646-716-5812. Again, that number is 646-716-5812. If you want to add to the discussion, you know I love hearing from you guys. I love hearing whatever it is you have to say because, of course, this show is yours. Anyhow, let me go ahead and start handling the the comments here. Let's see. Been a while. Michael Rodnan says, been a while since I watched MSNBC outside of independent commentators picking clips. I hear you, my brother, but I got to do it for you guys so I can get the pertinent clips to put, put it out for you. Uh, Dalia Lugo, welcome aboard, Dalia. Take care. Take care. All right. Bruce says, are you uh, taking into account the last 20 minutes of President's presentation? He took an interesting tack to, be, uh, to, to maybe get us afloat. Uh, the thing about it is I, uh, the President has zero credibility with me. So everything that I think he says... I generally don't believe or try to figure out what's a monetary ulterior motive for him or his uh, benefactors. I don't think he does anything with any care for the, Uni with the people of the United States. And I know it's time for us to try to be, uh, you know, and you know, I, I believe in talking to my brothers and sisters from all stripes of life. It doesn't matter what, what persuasion you are, a liberal, Democrat, progressive, independent, Republican, right wing. I consider everybody my brothers and sisters. The president, I put in a special category. And that special category is absolutely never believe anything he says. And the other category I do is I superimpose impossible to do anything good for anybody. That is what I keep focused on. It is impossible for him to do anything good for anybody. If the results are something good happens to somebody that is just the that just happens to be oh that's the fallout uh michael rodden describing the problems with our our profit health care system yes sir hi rose williams bruce is here again gregory bartz what about the clip yesterday didn't that say yes the clip yesterday from um <clears throat> from uh what's her name porter katie porter katie porter said that there is regulation already inculcated within the law that says Yes, the government can declare they will pay for all testing. And she said that that authority was already there for the director of the CDC to use. I think his name is Robert Heidi or something like that. Okay, Chrissy Marie, Be let's see, Chrissy Marie Bebenito. Hello, welcome aboard, Chrissy Marie Bebenito. Okay, Gregory Bart says the Katie Porter. Yeah, Peter, Katie Porter. Okay. Lee Grant says Trump just announced a remarkable marshalling of the public and private sectors to address a national emergency. Testing, diagnosis, and treatment will be widely available to all Americans. Okay, how long ago this virus has been in America since December? At least since December, and we knew about it. What were they doing? Waiting for the private sector to catch up after he fired all the people? Come on, guys. Let's not fall for the con. Gregory Bartz, he also announced that Mexico... 
<laughs> would pay for the wall. Good comeback, uh, Gregory. Michael Rodnin, if the people start to die in mass, the economy will crash harder. Exactly. And for that reason, MMT is a much better solution, right? M modern monetary theory. Inflate the economy so that people can, first of all, feel they don't have to infect other people by going to work even though they know they're sick. And it will make, have, give, them, uh, give them the resources they need to stay home. Very smart, Rodnin. Okay, Lee Grant replying to Gregory Bartz. I hope your cynicism doesn't dissuade someone from getting help. No, Lee Grant. Everybody is, they are looking for help. It is impossible for one to dissuade anybody from help. The only person does that is Donald Trump when he does things like, I'm not going to get tested, even though I've been corralling, corralling with... Uh, I've been corralling with a whole lot of folks who already are infected with the disease, but I don't need to get tested. That's what he says. So, no, I, that, that, I don't think so, sir. Uh, Michael Rodney to Lee Grant, the testing should be subsidized, free to the citizens. Absolutely so. Mike Cisak says, Egberto wants millions of people to die. Mike Cisak, do you really believe that? Do you really believe Egberto wants millions of people to die this person that is trying to get policies instituted to save people i want them to die no the people that commit voluntary manslaughter in this country are generally the people that go against policies like uh, uh the medical the medicaid expansion to the affordable care act which probably uh, kills people when you don't get it we can we can talk about issue after issue where the policies of conservative representatives, conservative politicians, materially harm people, kill people. All right, I like that idea, Bruce. Door-to-door -door virus tests and at the same time the census people come to take the census. You know, that would be efficient uses of, uh, of government, uh, you know, of people coming. I think that's an excellent idea, Bruce. We get some great ideas from people. Rose says, Lee Grant, why did he turn down the free testing kits from who much earlier? Because, again, Rose, we know the answer. He wanted it for his friends. That's it. I don't, by the way, folks, that statement I just made was not a corroborated statement in fact or proof. Anytime I make statements that are not corroborated, you know, sometimes I'm joking around, I let it be known. I don't want anybody to think that I know something I don't at all. I won't do that. Okay. Uh, Mike said, Rose, Trump didn't, because who doesn't offer testing kits? Bruce Fillard, an interesting idea, but doubt we have the resources. Um, well, I, I think what I mean, if you mean not having to test equipment for each census taker to carry with them, I think I'm with you there, Rose. I, I think uh, Bruce may be implying that since that person is going to be in somebody's home, they could actually use that same time to swab. If there are five people in the home, swab those five people, put it in a little test tube, put it in a bag, and ship it off every night. I, I mean, it, it, the, the, it, the extra 15 minutes at that person's home I think would be pre pretty darn good. I, I, I like the idea, Rose. I like, I like Bruce's idea. Okay, Lawrence Sims. Did Donald take care of this? PolitiFact, Bloomberg, Donald Trump. Oh, I looked that up at PolitiFact. He did fire the pandemic, uh, the, the pandemic team. He did fire them. That's a statement of fact. Okay, uh, Lee Grant says, Why test, widespread testing is imminent. Yes, Lee Grant, and I think it's important, and that's a good thing. Bruce Pollard, it is what we have now. Congress is not going to change it today. Michael Rudnan replied to Mike Cizak, backwards, millions of people are going to die. Our health care system is running like that in a developing nation. We need to subsidize care for people who can't afford it. But I think we need to subsidize care for everybody and let everybody have a stake in the game. Medicare for all, where all our taxes, our taxes are used for medical care. If you need care, you get it. If you don't need it, you don't get it. But as far as having rich people pay for their own care and poor people, not that's not what I'm for. I'm for all of us paying for the health care of all of us. That makes it a right. Okay, Michael Rodney said, Egberto, depraved heart murder. It's a question of duty of care. Yes, sir, I think I agree if I understand your statement correctly, uh, Mr. Rodney. Okay, Mike Cisek says, which Trump, um, Bruce, better idea, which Trump help organize, site up, sign up at a website and then drive to the, actually, that's a good idea. It wasn't Trump's idea, but it's a good idea. Walmart parking lots for screening. Yes, that's what's out there now. Mike Cisak, Rose is incorrect. The CDC, not the WHO, initially had some tests, but they didn't have the right detection as they had to recall the test. Whatever the case is, the tests in America were non-functional, were incorrect. 
the test in Europe were working. Let's just look at outcomes. Let's look at results. We were not, we were behind the ball. Okay, it's happening quickly, then it will be a big winner. You're right, Bruce, about that. Running in Georgia with the name. Sorry, you're going to get crushed. Michael Rodnin, we'll see. I think her district is different than Georgia proper. So she, I think she fits her district pretty well. Uh, drive through testing has already started in some of the most hard-hit areas, including New York. Actually, it's in New York right now. The governor of New York, along with the mayor of New York, they've been doing some hard work to get these mobile test units. New Rochelle is currently a center, a, a town, where this is happening just fine. Bruce says, so there is a root cause that must be addressed, but I think not now. I get your point about not now. Here's a problem that I have, though, Bruce, and you can kind of comment on that uh, to respond here. Americans have short-term memory, and as soon if we don't, if we don't take care of, 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 if we don't take care of stamping those who have really messed up what's going on right now, those who are should be held accountable for what's occurring right now, as soon as everything is done as soon as this passes as trump would say people are going to be moving on to the next thing they're not going to be there for the uh what do you call that uh whenever after you're, you're done with something what is that word that you use folks help me out here uh they're not going to stick around for the forensics okay they are not going to sit down for the forensics after the cause i think it is important that now we start talking about these issues um uh, let's see, Rose Williams says, uh, I'm happy he's finally doing something sensible, but since the incubation period is five days and symptoms typically eight to 15 days, his response has been very extraordinarily slow, I think is a good, um, good response to that. Okay, Rose, which is a terrifying problem with the epidemics. Okay, let's see. Go Nabila from Bartz. Yes, good luck in Georgia. By the way, the R <laughs> of the novel coronavirus is estimated to be 2.2. It's more like catching the flu, 1.3. It's twice as much. Actually, it's more like three times as much from what I read. Maywood says, yes, he did, Mike. Of course, he said it would happen after the audit is done. But president taxes are all automatically audited. Maywood, the problem with the virus is that we do, do build up antibodies, but they're not, they're not long-lasting and the viruses mutate. That is so true. The issue is a perfect example why we need Medicare for all and sick pay for all workers. Maywood, that's the bottom line. If you have a good safety, social safety net, you can handle pandemics. Even Italy, which, got, which was a slow process, Italy has more beds per thousand than America. Think about that. Italy has more doctors and beds per thousand in America, they are a single-payer system. They work perfectly, but they got caught behind the, f the ball because of you know it's a tourist place and people are coming in from all over the world. Their infection rate was astronomical, so they had to take astronomical astronomical reasons or th they had to do astronom some crazy things to solve this problem. Now, if you take a look at Korea, another place with single-payer healthcare, look at how great things are working out. Uh, working out there. Look how great things are working out there. Okay, Bruce, all things aside, I'm willing to pay higher taxes to get everyone who needs a test. Just make the really rich people pay more because people make, because poor people, oh, I love that. And thank you for the word, Rose Williams, post-mortem. Yeah, I said, I said the forensic, but I think post-mortem is the word that I was actually looking for. Uh, let's see. And that was the last comment in the string and we're at 355 it looks like i got through all these notes faster than i usually well actually you know what what is interesting is we are at our thousandth comment i just sent a tweet out restream says we had a thousand comments all together wow anyhow folks it's been my pleasure to be here uh, uh one more time i want to urge you all to please Go visit our store at store.politicsdoneright.com, store.politicsdoneright.com, and pick up one of our T-shirts. One of the ones that I like is, I support independent media. Secondly, go ahead and get a copy of As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. If you're like me, who've always been battling your weight, of course, I have the book that I wrote called Lose Weight and Be Fit Now. 
It tells my whole story of how I really decided to take my health into my own hands. And without any commercial diets or anything, I just did it. You know, got into a healthy way, got my pre- blood pressure healthy, all that good stuff. I put my flaws, my fallbacks, the, the mistakes that I made, all that good stuff. I was honest in the book, so check it out as well. But don't forget what we also need, our subscribers. So please go ahead and subscribe to Politics Done Right. It is very, very inexpensive and you're doing, you'll feel positive that you know you're helping other people learn what they need to learn so that the next every election we get a bit smarter every election we're able to do things better that is what it's all about and of course you want to contribute you can contribute either by going to paypal.me slash politics and right or super chat me let me see if i got any super chats i got a couple of yesterday i don't see any super chats in there today who's going to be my first super chat of the day who yes thank you maywood my daughter is Oh, uh, a, a quick update before I exit. For those of you who know, I've been telling the story about my daughter who had a stroke. Uh, she lost half her vision. She's 28 years old, third year in, uh, med student. She had to miss her uh, third clinical rotation in her third year because, again, she was hit with this stroke. Ironically, it was 30 days, exactly one month after her grandmother had a stroke and two weeks after her grandmother died, and then my daughter gets a stroke, lost half her vision. Luckily, luckily, she went to the doctor earlier this week. She is from 50% of the vision. She's now at 75% of her vision. We're hoping that it all comes back. Thank you guys so kindly for your prayers. Thank you guys so kindly for all the great thoughts. I mean, I always talk about my listeners being a family because I've gotten so many personal notices, personal emails, messages, direct messages on Facebook. All when I was in that ICU 24-7 with my baby, it was wonderful hearing from all of you. I, I love that's When I look at you guys and say, I love you all, I mean, you think it's, just, it's not just a phrase, it's, it's real. Because, I mean, you always know that you got a village when... Things are hard for you and people are still in touch with you. Some people are like, hey, Bert, I haven't seen you in two days on, 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 on Politics Done Right. And when I give the message, oh, I'm sorry. And, but look, I want to thank you guys because, again, you guys also uh, made it possible for me to keep some of my sanity as I watch my daughter recover. Well, the good news is that 75% of her vision is back. She starts back her rotation supposedly next week if the coronavirus doesn't change all of that good stuff. But anyhow, you guys are wonderful. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out!